I feel it a great honor, brothers and sisters, to share with you a few moments in this, the last session of this inspired conference. I'm sure that as we have listened to the messages of our brethren during these various sessions, we can't help but feel a deep appreciation in our hearts that the Lord saw fit to institute in his restored church the practice of holding conferences. Just think of the inspiring counsel and advice we have had here to help us to put our own lives in order and the lives of our loved ones and the families and our young people and how to treat our neighbors and friends and the responsibilities that are ours and the political affairs that we have to participate in our communities and all that's been said here today. And now as we listen to this beautiful song so beautifully rendered by our choir, the Prophet Joseph's uh, first prayer. Just think, that is the most important message to go out to all the world today. And in President Smith's opening address, he said, the Lord's work shall triumph. No power on earth can prevent the spread of truth and the preaching of the gospel in every nation. And then in the priesthood meeting last night, he added, the gospel shall roll forth until it shall fill the whole earth. And then if the gospel is going to roll forth and fill the whole earth, what a responsibility we Latter-day Saints have with our families in helping to roll it forth into all the earth. There's no message in this world today that could be told that be as valuable to our neighbors and our friends who are not members of this church as to bear witness of this great event about which the choir has just sung. I think of the words of the apostle Peter of old. He said to the saints of his day, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, why? That you might show forth the praises of him who hath called you forth out of darkness unto his marvelous light. And we have been admonished in this conference to let our light so shine as Jesus said that others seeing our good works may be led to glorify our Father which is in heaven. And then Paul tells us that faith comes by hearing the word of God. And how shall they hear, except it be preached unto them? And how shall they preach, except they be sent? And therefore there rests upon this people the great responsibility of bearing witness to the entire world of what the Lord has done in restoring his truth to the earth in this dispensation. When Jesus was asked by his disciples for the sign of his second coming. And you recall he told them about the wars and the rumors of wars and pestilence and earthquakes and famines and nations should rise against nation. And then he adds, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. Where would one look today to find that gospel of the kingdom that Jesus referred to, not according to man's interpretation of the scriptures, but where the divine power rests, such as Jesus gave to his 12 when he said, you've not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Anybody could organize the church and take from the scriptures sum the scriptures and base the church upon it, but how can they get a living branch off of a dead tree, so to speak? How can they put in it the power and the authority to act in the name of the Lord? They couldn't do that any more than they could act for the mayor of the town, the governor of the state, the president of the United States, without being duly commissioned so to do. And neither can anyone work effectively in the kingdom of our Father in heaven without they have divine authority given to them by those who have the right to so convey. And so we stand here as witnesses of the restoration of the gospel 
and bear our witness to all the world that we do know that Christ lives, that our Father lives, that he has, they have visited this earth as was sung in that song to the prophet Joseph. And he announced to the prophet Joseph in answer to his inquiry which of all the churches he should join, that he should join none of them, for they taught for doctrine the commandments or precepts of men. And so I think it wouldn't be so hard if people were just open-minded to know where to find the truth. And we, of course, would take the Bible as our guide to help us in our uh, search for the truth. I've always been greatly impressed by a little experience that Brother Orson F. Whitney had, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, that he related in one of our conferences, and I'd like to read that to you. He said, many years ago, a learned man, a member of the Roman Catholic Church, came to Utah and spoke from the stand of the Salt Lake Tabernacle. I became well acquainted with him, and we conversed freely and frankly, a great scholar with, per with perhaps a dozen languages at his tongue's end. He seemed to know all about theology, law, literature, science, and philosophy. One day he said to me, you Mormons are all ignoramuses. You don't know the strength of your own position. It is so strong that there is only one other tenable in the whole Christian world, and that is the position of the Catholic Church. The issue is between Catholicism and Mormonism. If we are right, you are wrong. If you are right, we are wrong. And that's all there is to it. The Protestants haven't a leg to stand on, for if we are wrong, they are wrong with us, since they were a part of us and went out from us. While if we are right, they are apostates whom we cut off long ago. If we have the apostolic succession from St. Peter, as we claim, there is no need of Joseph Smith and Mormonism. But if we have not that succession, then such a man as Joseph Smith was necessary, and uh, Mormonism's attitude is the only consistent one. It is either the pre perpetuation of the gospel from ancient times or the restoration of the gospel in latter days. Now, it seems to me that if thinking people would just think, they must come to the conclusion that that is a correct statement if they want to find the gospel that Jesus said, this everlasting gospel that should be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations before he would come. One can't study the Holy Scriptures without knowing that the prophets have declared an apostasy from the original church. When uh, uh, John the Revelator was banished upon the Isle of Patmos, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Come up hither, and I will show you that which must be hereafter. And he showed him all things from the uh, war in heaven to the final winding up scenes, and he showed him the power that would be given to Satan to make war with the saints, and the saints were the followers of Christ in his church. And he said that his power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Why should that be in the Holy Scriptures if the gospel was to remain upon the earth from the days of St. Peter down to the present time? And Paul was constantly warning the people in his day that they should not look for the coming of Jesus until there should be a falling away and the man of sin would be revealed. And others of the prophets of like man test likewise testified of the day when there should be a famine in the land, not a famine for bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the word of God and how they should wander from the east to the west to the north to the south, seeking the word of God and should not find it. Why? Because it was not upon the earth to be found. And if the gospel was to remain upon the earth, then when the angel of the Lord showed unto John the power that would be given to Satan 
to make war with the saints and to overcome them and all kindreds and tongues and nations, he would have to have made an exception to the one that still possessed the, the everlasting gospel. And that's a witness that there should, the truth should not be upon the earth at that time. And then the scriptures are replete with promises of a restoration in the latter days. I like this statement by St. Peter following the day of Pentecost when he said to those who had put to death the Christ, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send unto you Jesus Christ, who before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the time of the restitution of all things spoken by the mouths of all the holy prophets since the world began. And now if Peter was a prophet of God, we can't look forward to the second coming, nor can the world, until there should be a restitution and not a reformation. And there's a great difference between remodeling an old house and building a new one. And as far as I know in all the missionary work that I have done, there's no other church in this world that claims a restitution of all things spoken by the mouths of all the holy prophets since the world began. This event that we heard in the choir of the coming of the Father and the Son, followed by Moroni, a prophet who'd lived upon this earth 400 years after the time of Christ and brought the plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated. John the Baptist, who was beheaded for the testimony of Jesus as a resurrected being returned and conferred upon Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, the Aaronic priesthood with power to baptize by immersion for the remission of sins and told them that, the, 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 uh, that later the Melchizedek priesthood would be restored, which would be the power to administer the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. And Peter, James, and John, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are with him in the Mount of the Transfiguration, returned and brought back that Melchizedek priesthood, could all the money in the world buy things that could mean as much to the children of our Father in heaven as these events that transpired and what can come to us individually and to our families and to our friends and our loved ones through the coming of these holy messengers. And that isn't all. And then there came Elijah the prophet of whom Malachi spoke that were it not for his coming before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord that the whole earth would utterly be wasted at his coming if he didn't come to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest he come and smite the whole earth with a curse. And that opens the door for an understanding of the words of the Apostle Paul when he said that the Lord had revealed the mystery of his will unto him, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he would bring together in one in Christ Jesus all that which is in heaven above and that which in the earth beneath. We live in the dispensation of the fullness of times and the coming of Elijah has brought the keys and that's why we build these holy temples. That's why we have this great genealogical program the like of which can't be found anywhere in all this world. And so the prophets have foreseen the coming. John, while he was upon the Isle of Patmos, didn't only see the power that Satan would have to make war with the saints and to reign over them all, but he saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth and to every nation and every kindred and every tongue and every people, which would not have been necessary if there had been a continuation of the gospel. And then he said, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. We live in the day of his judgment. And then he adds, And worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. The time that Joseph Smith had his marvelous vision, there wasn't a church in the world worshiping the God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water and created man in his own image. They worshiped in essence everywhere present and they described him without body, parts, or passion. Sits on the top of a topless throne. It's about his best explanation of nothing as a person could write. If he doesn't have a body, how could he speak? 
How could he hear? How could he understand and talk? And that's what Moses understood because when he went to lead the children of Israel into the promised land, he told them that they would not remain there long, but that they should be scattered among the nations, and they would worship gods made by the hands of man that could neither see, nor hear, nor taste, nor smell. And that's the kind of a God this world was worshiping at the time that Joseph Smith had his marvelous vision. But Moses saw something more. He saw that in the latter days, and we live in the latter days, that if his people would surely search, search, search after him, seek after him, they should surely find him. And Joseph Smith answering that admonition in James, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and it braideth not, and it shall be given him. He went and sought after him as Moses uh, advised, and he found the true and the living God. And now we have a testimony to bear to all of the world to this extent. I see, I think of the words of the Apostle Paul when we've already read reference made to there when he said that he claimed to know nothing but Jesus and him crucified. That doesn't mean that he didn't know the old prophets and appreciate them, but a new day had come. The Son of God had come of whom the prophets have spoken. And then he said, the necessity is placed upon me and woe be unto me if I preach not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In that same sense, the, we know nothing but the restoration of the gospel, but it was brought by the Son of Man himself so that there's no separation from the Son and the prophets of this dispensation. And woe be unto us if we share not with the world these marvelous truths. Brothers and sisters, I know this is the work of God, the eternal Father. It's the greatest movement in all this world today, and there isn't an honest man or an honest woman in this world who really loves the Lord, who wouldn't join this church if they'd take time to find out what it is and ask God, the eternal Father, who will not mislead them. And that's my witness and testimony to you, and I leave it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.